Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to Major Migrations Made Easy. Uh, as I said, I'm, my name is Tim Tobake, and I'm a staff software engineer at Modern, where I work on Open Rewrite. I want to thank you all for coming, because it appears we have quite some interest in uh, running major migrations uh, today. But even though this is a presentation on migrations, I'm not going to ask you all to raise your hand to indicate what versions of Java or frameworks you're using. And that's because it's not very representative. If I ask the audience who is using Java 17, then some overconfident folks will raise their hand as soon as they've managed to get one service up and running on Java 17, and then completely ignoring the fact that they've not yet migrated to some of the new language features, and that they've left behind the rest of the company back on Java 8. So instead, since you've all made it here, I think it's safe to say that we're, uh, you're quite likely you're still working with something that you want to get rid of. And if not, you're welcome to silently accuse the person next to you of still using Java 8 or JUnit 4 somewhere, and you'll likely be right. Now, before I switched to Modern, I was a consultant for five years, and that's perhaps much like yourselves. I specialized in migration engineering, which is a way of saying I would walk into an organization, familiarize myself with all the old technologies that they were still using, and then gradually hack away at lifting everything up to the latest versions. I would frequently find five or even ten-year-old versions of Java, JUnit, and Spring, which is not great from a security perspective, or even for the developer experience. Initially, I would migrate these services by hand and gradually introduce more and more coarse-grained automation. So imagine my excitement when I discovered Open Rewrite. Open Rewrite promises to make light work of all such migrations. I got so excited about this technology that I started to contribute and even present about this at conferences, and eventually quit consulting to work on Open Rewrite full-time. So, after a nice sabbatical, that brings us here today. And perhaps you face some of the same challenges that I did. At a conference like this one, you'll hear all that's coming up in the new Java 21 in September, and any new framework releases coming up as well. But then, back at work, you're still stuck using Java 8 and JUnit 4. And migrating all of that by hand can seem daunting if it ever gets priority. I want to show you how easy it can be to perform major migrations. That way, you too can adopt the latest language and framework features. And it can be fun to adopt new language features, such as records and text blocks, but you don't want to adopt these features manually or only on a single project. Instead, we will look into automation to make old projects feel like new projects again, rather than one that's just had its version number changed. That way, you can benefit from JVM, language, and framework improvements. Here's a brief overview of the types of migrations I'll be talking about. Likely, you've already performed some of these migrations in the past. And other migrations are always just around the corner. And I, if you look back over time, there's a near constant stream of worthwhile improvements to pick up. And I like the challenge, so I still get excited whenever a new version comes out. I just don't like the repetitive steps that come with updating. And if you try to keep up by hand, you will hardly get anything else done, especially as microservices these days mean you're not just upgrading once, but dozens of times. Over the years, we've seen uh, countless organizations adopt microservices which tend to look alike. That can be either by consciously using reference templates, or by simply copy and pasting from the last service you worked on for any new development. And this can be great for knowledge sharing or reusing shared components. But when a critical issue arises in your technology stack, suddenly everything's on fire. To react quickly, you need a framework that allows you to, to make uh, broad sweeping changes uh, safely and at scale. Automation may be the only option, especially for large organizations, maintaining thousands of services. 
Now, to show you just how easy it is to migrate a project, I've prepared a small demo. For this demo, we will upgrade a Spring Pet Clinic branch from Spring Boot 2 on Java 8 all the way to Spring Boot 3 on Java 17. We will look at the commands and changes made in more detail along the way. Now, for this demo, I'm going to take you to the documentation that we have on Open Rewrite. If you only remember one thing from this presentation, let it be docs.openrewrite.org. That's where we have all the instructions on uh, how to run Open Rewrite recipes, what recipes we have available, how to develop your own recipes, and if you get stuck along the way, you can, uh, how to reach us to get help. Now, as I said, we're going to look at a uh, Spring Boot migration. And for that, we're going to um, switch to that particular recipe. Now, a recipe is a set of rules that we apply to make changes to your project uh, such that you can upgrade you to the latest version. Now, for this particular one, we're going to migrate you to Spring Boot 3. But if you're not a Spring Boot 3 user, there's probably still going to be some changes in here that will be relevant to your project. Because as part of a migration to Spring Boot 3, you're going to have to upgrade to Java 17. And you're also going to have to update, uh, uh, pick up Jakarta instead of the Java X dependencies. And if we look back at the, uh, the changes that we make for Java 17, we're not just going to um, update your compiler settings, but we also pick up some optional changes, such as introducing text blocks and introducing pattern matching for switch. And if you haven't yet upgraded to Java 11, we're going to take you there as well and get you all of the JXB dependencies that you need to add to uh, modernize your application. So we will figure out where you are and up, uh, uh, apply any changes that you still have to make. So even if you forgot to apply any of these changes manually before, we can still modernize your application with these automations. Now, to run these migrations, it's fairly easy. We have a usage tab, which will show you the instructions for Gradle and Maven. But for Maven, it's even easier if you just run this one command at the root of your project. This will make all of the changes locally on your machine and output the uh, changes in your, into the same file server. Now, in the past, I've run this demo on my machine while on the stage, but it doesn't really look good, and it takes quite some time. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to our platform that we develop at Modern, which allows you to run the same open rewrite uh, uh, recipes against your own um, repositories at scale. So in this case, as you can see, we're going to run the migrate to Spring Boot uh, project against the Spring Pet Clinic, which is a reference implementation of how to use Spring and Spring Boot. Uh, this is all the same steps that you've seen before. And in this case, I'm going to do a dry run. So we're going to run all of these migration steps, but we're not yet going to make a commit. Now, in the background, we will um, load a serialized form of your project such that we can quite easily and quickly run these recipes. And you can see that I'm running this against two different branches of the same project. One is the main branch, which has already been upgraded to Spring Boot 3.1. And I'll show you in a minute why I'm still migrating a project that's already using Spring Boot 3. The other branch is a 2.0.0 branch, which is from 2018. So it's not been updated since, but we're still able to make the required changes to upgrade this to the latest version. And as you can see, we ran this in just some 38 seconds. So I'll explore the changes for the 2.0 branch first. And as the first change, you can see that we're also making um, optional changes. So in this case, we're removing the auto-wired annotation, which you've been able to do as of Spring 2.0. But still, you're going to find that you have a lot of these uh, throughout your code space still. And it's just not necessary. It makes your application feel like a dated application rather than something that was developed for Spring Boot 3. So we remove this any place that we can find it. 
And we also, in, for instance here, introduce text blocks when you're concatenating a string across multiple lines. It's these kind of optional changes that really make your application feel more recent. If we scroll further down, you can see that we're also replacing the Java X validation and, uh, imports with the Jakarta ones. We've migrated this test from JUnit 4 to JUnit 5. We've removed some visibility modifiers. And if you're ever wondering, well, why did we make this change? Well, we can tell you exactly why we're making these changes. The test changes are just part of the JUnit 4 to JUnit 5 migration, which is part of the Spring Boot 2.4 to 2.5. And we just run this just because we know that you have to migrate if you go to Spring Boot 3. If we scroll even further down, you can see that there's a lot of changes that you would otherwise have to have been making by hand. And we just want you to know that it's not necessary to make these changes by hand anymore. You can just run this one automation and, and get this uh, all up and running. Here you can see that we're not just updating your code, we're also looking at properties. The Spring uh, developers have a habit of renaming properties between versions that you're done going to have to find, either in your properties files or in a YAML file or in your config server. And it's annoying because your compiler won't complain about this, but it will still be an issue at runtime. So what we do is we reliably find these properties, rename them for you, and make sure that the first run that you do will actually work. Now, I want to take you to the pom.xml file just to show you the changes that we make there. And again, you can see we have to scroll past quite a lot of manual changes. But I know it's coming up. Uh, yep. So here you can see we uh, changed the parent version of Spring Boot uh, to 3.0.7. We've not yet developed a recipe for 3.1, but I think we can fairly easily do that as well. It came out just last week. We need to uh, update that as well. Next, we deduce that this is a property which will set the compiler, source, and target versions. So we're swapping that from 1.8 to 17. And we figured that this plugin is incompatible on the older version for Java 17. So we just bumped it to a compatible version. We also introduce some dependencies that you use to get transitively, just to ensure that your application remains working. And if you go even further down, you can see that, for instance, the Cobertura coverage plugin is incompatible with Java 17. So we've chosen to remove that. Now, ideally, you'll replace this with Jacoco, but that's not an uh, automated change that you are comfortable making for you. So instead, we're going to make sure that your application will run on Java 17 and leave it up to you to plug in any new coverage uh, plugin that you might want to use, such as Jacoco. Now, if you think this all looks good, you can either validate these results, which will kick off a CI pipeline, or uh, if you're brave, you start a commit, and this can be either directly or you create a pull request or a, uh, a fork, whichever uh, way fits your um, uh, way of working best. Now, and then I think concludes this uh, migration to uh, from Spring uh, 2.0 to 3.0. But I wanted to show you as well, like why are we changing a project that is already on Spring Boot 3? Well, if you have a look at the changes there, you can see that even the reference implementation of the Spring Pet Clinic project still has some optional changes that we still can apply. For instance, here we, can, we no longer have to specify an uh, annotation argument if it can also be deduced from the, parameter, uh, from the compiler argument. We also uh, can introduce text blocks, as we've seen before, and we no longer have to add the auto-wired annotation. This is all still present in the main branch of the Spring Patternic project. So if you want to ruin my next demo, you can commit these results, start a pull request, and it will be fixed the next time. But I want to highlight that this really goes to show that even on a reference implementation, it can make sense to do an um, automated migration, because you'd otherwise be missing out on some of these steps. So that's migrations covered. Um, 
But then we figured, well, we have this system of making automated code changes. There's probably some more things that we can do that are of value to your project. And for that, I'm going to take you to a different recipe that we have. So we have a marketplace of recipes where you can find anything that might be applicable to your projects, such as changing anything for GitHub Actions or Quarkers or Micronaut, whatever you want. But in this case, I want to have a look at the common static analysis issues. If in your organization you're using a tool like Sonar Cube or Sonar Cloud, you will find that that probably gives you a, a good report of issues where you're not quite living up to the code standards that they'd want you to. But where they give you a report and tell you exactly what you should be changing, we figured we can do better than that. So we covered some of the same recipe, of the, the same issues that they have, but turned them into recipes to actually apply the suggested code changes. And where before I showed you that we can run uh, recipes against a single project, the Spring Pad Clinic, I want to show you that we can also run all of these fixes. There's some 60 plus uh, well-known Sonar Cube issues. And we can run them against 140 repositories, which are just some well-known Spring projects and Netflix projects um, that we uh, support in our platform. And as this is running, you can see that we have like an estimated uh, time saving that keeps adding up as new uh, results come in. And again, we can dive into individual code changes. And we will tell you exactly, like here we renamed a variable, and here we are uh, splitting them out across different lines. And a lot of these changes, again, you would otherwise have to make by hand. But we just fully support you running all of this quite quickly against an entire organization to really make those graphs that you have in Sonar nosedive with all the technical depth that you're able to resolve quickly. Now we verify and test all the recipes that we have. So what we want you to be comfortable with is just select all of these changes that we proposed uh, at the same time. In this case, some 200 hours of time savings. And just commit all of that. And then for that morning, you're done. You've, you've solved all these sonar cube findings that were just at the top of your list. And you can actually start to focus on what would be the next most um, uh, most often found violations. So again, this is a, a great way of showing you that you can use these automations to really reduce any kind of issues that you have in your source code. And this is just showing you two uh, aggregate recipes that we have, but there's quite a bit more we can do. So for instance, we have similar recipes to cross-reference all your dependencies and your transitive dependencies all the way down against the GitHub vulnerabilities the database and just resolve all of those vulnerabilities at the same time. And if you look uh, further, we have a lot of best practice uh, recipes as well. To uh, yeah, just make sure that you're am I able to type. Just to resolve a lot of common issues within your code base. So I'd say that this is pretty convincing to have you look at what these automations could uh, mean for your projects and start to apply these changes uh, broadly and quickly, easily. And so with that, I think we're going to take you back to the presentation. Uh, let me check. Do -do -do. And full screen. So, as we've seen through Open Rewrite, you can now upgrade quite easily between versions of Java and Spring with a single command. And you can even migrate between frameworks, such as from JUnit to AssertJ, and even from Java EE to Spring. In this talk, I'll tell you all about Open Rewrite, how we're actually able to make all of these code changes. I'll tell you how the project came about, and how it works, and what you can do with it. And finally, we'll briefly look at who's developing these recipes and how to apply them to open source projects. So, Open Rewrite was started at Netflix, initially to aid in the migration of an internal logging framework to SLF4J. You can probably imagine that any logging framework is going to be pervasive throughout an organization. 
To even consider migrating, you'd need perfectly accurate automation, especially when usage is spread across hundreds of services. So they developed a parser to accurately read Java and turn the source code into a lossless semantic tree. This model can then be modified to replace the old logging statements with calls to SLF4J. And next, the migrated model is written out as close as possible to the original source code. This way, the applied changes are minimal, leaving surrounding code untouched. And later, the same developers moved on to work on Spinnaker. And while trying to onboard teams and organizations there, they found that teams often struggled with these same outdated language and framework uh, versions. To help these teams adopt the latest versions, they applied a different set of transformations through the same lossless semantic tree parser. This allowed them to quickly reduce this technical depth, bringing teams from Spring Boot 1 to 2 and from JUnit 4 to JUnit 5. And the project has since been open sourced, with the company behind it uh, committed to making all recipes available on the Apache license for open source software. The initial focus for Open Reward is on Java virtual machine languages and surrounding technologies. There are parsers for Java, Groovy, Kotlin, YAML, and XML. And these in turn unlock support for build tools such as Maven and Gradle. And ultimately, libraries such as JUnit, AssertJ, and Guava. In the end, you're able to migrate entire frameworks and platforms uh, with recipes available for application frameworks, such as Micronaut, Quarkus, and Spring. OpenRiva is not the only parser capable of understanding and manipulating Java. However, there are three benefits that you get with OpenRiva that you wouldn't get with any other implementation. The first is our focus on exact type attribution. By having the exact type available on any tree element, we can be sure to only uh, uh, manipulate exact matches. Other parsers might skip this deep uh, type attribution step to get better performance, but then lack the ability to match and apply certain transformations. The second characteristic that sets Open Rewrite apart is our format preservation. We not only take into account the functional code, but also the surrounding code style and indentation. This allows us to accurately reproduce your source file, uh, regardless of further changes. Any changes made through OpenRewrite will look just like a colleague worked on your code. And this is different than from, for instance, Google Error Prone, where, uh, which forces you to use an opinionated formatter which might not be a big deal in some cases, but when you have 20 years' worth of commit history, you might not want to uh, reformat all of that, just for some simple replacements. And finally, our serialization format ensures that you're able to query and refactor uh, your code faster and at scale. And together, these features make OpenRewrite exceptionally good at safe code transformations. The changes are minimally invasive and guaranteed to work, in part due to our do-no-harm mentality. By manipulating the full lossless semantic tree, OpenRewrite can far exceed simple search and replace operations. With the full lossless semantic tree built, we need to instruct OpenRewrite what operations to apply and where to apply them in your code. Recipes are how you define such a group of search and refactoring operations. Together, they accomplish a higher level task, such as a framework migration. Recipes can consist of a single standalone operation or be linked together with other recipes. Open Rewind comes with a large collection of fine grained recipes out of the box that can be combined for common migration steps. You can think of these as Lego building blocks, ready to be applied with the proper parameters. There are hundreds of these building blocks to, for instance, change types, change methods, change arguments, manipulate properties, and alter dependencies and plugins. Individual recipes are implemented as a Java visitor that first matches and then modifies elements of the lossless semantic tree. There are plenty of examples available, but note that you only need a dedicated Java visitor when none of the existing recipes can already achieve your goal. Typically, you can get very far only configuring, combining, and applying existing recipes through a YAML description file. 
Modules then group together these fine-grained recipes into more coarse-grained, application-specific recipes. There are modules, for example, for logging frameworks, testing frameworks, and application frameworks, such as Spring. Think of these as Lego sets, with build plans for common migrations and fixes, ready to be used. In my opinion, the lossless semantic tree, combined with the large collection of open source recipes, is what sets OpenRewrite apart from other similar tools, such as Google Error Prone's Refaster. Now I want to show you briefly how recipes are configured in OpenRewrite. Let's briefly look at a migration from JUnit 4 to JUnit 5. I want you to imagine what steps would be needed for such a migration. You likely know a couple of these steps already. Among others, you would have to update the test annotations, but you would also have to update the assertions and sometimes the argument order. You'd have to update all imports, you'd have to update any test rules, and that's just getting started. Notice how each step is reflected as a separate recipe in this YAML configuration file. Some refer to and configure generic steps, such as the change type recipe. Others are implemented as an imperative step, a dedicated Java visitor that first matches and then modifies elements of the lossless semantic tree. And all these steps combine to achieve a complete JUnit 5 migration. And this is a common pattern with Open Rewrite. Large migrations are broken up into small reusable steps. When we run this recipe, we get predictable results, as you've seen in the demo. Our imports are converted as we would expect, and our Makita runner is converted into using the extension. Lifecycle annotations are correctly replaced. But interestingly, we can see how Open Rewrite shines through when it comes to converting expected exceptions. Having the full power of a lossless semantic tree combined with a Java visitor allows us to adopt assert throws. Now, this would not be possible with just any regular expression approach. And it's just a small sample of the types of transformations that are possible. Running migration recipes is fairly straightforward. First, you apply a build tool plugin for Open Rewind. I've used Maven in my example, but Gradle works just as well. Then, depending on the changes you want to make, you add a dependency on the respective Open Rewind module. And lastly, you run the Open Rewind plugin with the recipe that you want to execute. The commands shown here will migrate your application to the, the latest version of Spring Boot. And this works all the way back to Spring Boot 1.5. This will update dependencies, properties, deprecations for many older versions, and it includes the JUnit 5 migration, as you've seen before, as well as any Spring-specific test constructs. So now that we've seen how OpenRewrite works, let's have a look what else you can do with it. Obviously, by now, you've seen it as well suited to migrations. You've mostly seen migrations from one version to another, but you also can also migrate from one framework to another. If you want to switch from log4j to SLF4j, you can. And the same thing if you want to switch from JUnit to assertj. And even larger migrations are in development. Another application, as I've showed you, is static analysis findings. A large collection of check style, sonar, and security findings are supported to allow you to reduce the technical depth in minutes. And finally, there's a whole class of recipes to enforce a certain code style. And rather than merely apply a formatter, these style recipes go a step further to actually change your code. This ensures your code style reads consistently from project to project. And in addition to what's already available, it's fairly easy to add custom recipes specific to your projects. So now that we've seen how it works and what you can do, let's briefly look ahead at what is still to come. As you've seen, Open Rewrite has dedicated parsers for multiple languages already. But as you can imagine, we have some catching up to do still. We are further refining our parsers for both Java 21 and Kotlin. And note that you're perfectly able to run on Java 17 Plus, but you can't yet migrate to some of the new language features. 
the interesting, interesting thing about Kotlin is that our Java migration recipes will also just work. So if you have a Kotlin application using Spring, you can use the same recipes that we have to migrate that application as well. And that's even though the languages look a bit different. And we're testing this now together with the team behind the popular Kotlin Arrow framework, who are using open rewrites to migrate people to their latest version. We're also looking to make it even easier to define migration uh, recipes by using the approach popularized in uh, Google Arrow Prone's ReFaster. And while this won't be able to cover all cases, it is convenient when it can. We're also working on a CLI to make it easier to run recipes without changing the build. And using this to integrate with, for instance, GitHub Actions and GitLab CI for feedback on your pull requests. And we're also branching out into new language families. We recently added a parser for Python, and uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have one for TypeScript as well. All of these features are in active development. It's not exactly clear when you can use some of it, but it is uh, interesting developments, nonetheless. Now, I want to call out the refaster templates specifically here, as it will make recipe development a whole lot easier. As you can see here, we define a before template uh, uh, of the pattern that we want to replace as an annotated method taking in an argument. Then secondly, we define an after template with the code pattern that we want to see instead. These patterns are then matched throughout your code base and replaced uh, with ease. We like this approach so much that we're not just going to copy it, but instead we're going to use exactly these annotations. That also allows us to leverage the work of others, such as, for instance, at Picnic, who have defined and open sourced their um, yeah, refaster templates. Our users then get the benefit of applying refaster recipes at scale without the Google Java format enforced by Error Prone. And if you need more than Error Prone can support, we allow you to gradually switch to open rewrite recipes. Now, as a last subject, I want to tell you a bit about the company behind Open Rewrite. As I said before, Modern has committed to making all recipes available open source. You can run Open Rewrite on your own machine against any project that you like, including private code. It will work, but it won't be quick, and it will only update a single project at a time. With Modern, our focus is on applying recipes at scale. Through Modern, our clients can discover code patterns across their entire organization and target these for transformation. And even if you're not a paying customer, you can still use our web interface to browse available recipes and even apply them to open source projects, as you've seen me do in the demo. This can be a great way to start contributing back to open source software. And if you find that any migration steps are missing, Open Rewrite itself is very accepting of new contributions. The community plays a large role in the development of new recipes. And as you could maybe tell from my email address, tim at modern.io, we're not exactly a big company, but we're pretty well connected into the broader Java community. Through collaborations, other companies contribute migration recipes for their frameworks. These ensure that their users are able to migrate easily and timely with new releases. And if you maintain or merely enjoy a certain library or framework, you can help all other users by providing migration recipes. And this is something that I do on the weekend as well. So I've added migration recipes to frameworks such as Wicked and Axon just to ensure that their users are able to uh, migrate easily. And I've been using the platform to do some maintenance on Apache Maven. So the Apache Maven project has a very rich history. And as a result of that, they're using some patterns that they're not quite pleased with. So for instance, if you go to their uh, backlog, you can find that this issue, where they have not one, not two, not three, but four different instances of string utilities classes, and I even found a fifth one, which is only in one project. And all of them do the silliest things, like checking if a string is empty. You don't really need a uh, utilities class to check if a string is empty. You just check, is this string null? 
or is it empty? Just use the JDK. And what they're looking to do is phase out all of these different dependencies and then get rid of, I think, a couple megabytes worth of um, useless dependencies that are just not needed when you run anything. So what I've done with our platform is define an uh, initial set of recipes to uh, just replace this simple, is the string empty or is it not empty, uh, with a recipe. And I can take you through that recipe right here. So, as you can see, we're going to replace any calls to any kind of string utils that is empty. And that can be in the commons lang or shared utils or the plexes or whatever they. And we're going to replace that with just a call to check is it null or is it empty. And this might seem silly, but they had this some 2,000 times across some 90 repositories. And it's just silly stuff. We want to get rid of this, but no one in their right mind is going to do this on the weekend unless you have this automation to actually run it in a couple minutes. So if you look at how we've implemented this recipe, it's fairly straightforward. So we have a matcher, oh, let me close this one, which will just match any calls to is empty or is not empty. And if we find a match, we replace them with a replacement defined in this lambda. Now, as you've seen with the refaster templates, this will be even easier. But for now, this is how we've implemented uh, it. Then we do some checks, and if we're actually fairly confident, we check, could we remove the import uh, as well? Just to make sure that we don't have any dangling imports. And then we uh, do the replacement. And this way, I've been able to open uh, some 50, 60 pull requests to Apache Maven in just a couple minutes. I had one guy very kindly in, uh, uh, offer to actually review all of this, which you think, well, that's, that's not fun. But he kindly offered, so I'm quite pleased with that. And if you're wondering, well, how do we actually test all of this? Well, we just have unit tests. Any Java visitor is just going to be a program that you can run, and we have a framework to unit test that as well. So we define a before situation and an after situation that we want to use. And then, as a parameterized test, we're able to verify that we're able to support the exact cases that we want to replace. And this is for the is not empty, uh, is empty case, well, an is not empty case. But we also have one where it's negated. So we make sure that we're still using the not changing the behavior of the code. And if there's any cases where we don't want to do replacements, such as, uh, for instance, if you do a method call, we don't want to make that method call twice. So we just assert that we're not making any changes in those particular cases. Now, the only fun bit of feedback that I got from the Apache project on this was that it's, uh, one of the contributors asked me if, for every automated pull request that I open, if I would be so kind as to also open a JIRA ticket. And at that point, you kind of want to see, does your process really match the reality of making code changes at scale? In the end, we were able to push back on that, and uh, I've not had to do it, luckily. So uh, let me switch back again. So yeah, the upcoming versions of Apache Maven will have my commits in there. And if you want to contribute and do similar changes, there's a lot more that we want to replace, which is just going to be simple replacements that you can run through the platform. And you can do the same on any other project that we support. There's some 30,000 projects in the public platform, and we really invite you to engage with library and framework authors and use the framework to make those changes. And so with that, we are getting near the end of my presentation. Uh, before I send you on your way, I want to recommend a few resources where you can learn more. Firstly, there's extensive documentation available on OpenRewrite at docs.openrewrite.org. This is the same link that I told you. If you only remember one thing, have it be this one. All our development is on GitHub, with new suggestions picked up with surprising speed. And as we've seen already, it's fairly easy to uh, contribute minor migration steps. If you want to try some recipes quickly on open source projects, have a look at public.modern.io. That's the website I used in the demo, and you're free to use that as well. 
And if you uh, have any questions, you can reach out either on our public Slack or via email, whichever you prefer. And finally, if you would like to play around with some of the commands that I've shown you before, I've written a blog post to accompany this presentation. The blog post migrates an old Spring Pat Clinic branch from 1.5 on Java 8 to 2.x on Java 17, because I wrote this a year ago. And that way, you were able to play around with the commands and see the changes that are made at every step. For your own projects, I recommend you start with the testing framework migrations. They're an easy way to gain confidence in a tool and see what it can mean for your projects. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Are there any questions? Yeah, uh, if I got you right, you said that you regularly contribute uh, recipes for different frameworks. Mm -hmm. But isn't uh, also the case? Does it mean that the the framework providers don't do this? Uh, in, and isn't it in, in their best interest to to do this and involve with the community around yep. Open right? Yeah. So we have a mix of um, some frameworks we support just because they're often used but uh, the framework authors are not involved. And in other cases, we have collaborations. So for instance, with VMware for Spring, with Oracle for Micronaut, and for Red Hat for Quarkus, all of those original framework authors, they are involved. So they are actually contributing these recipes mm. to make sure that their users are able to migrate. Because it's a benefit to them as well. Their users will be more happy to, to upgrade to the latest version. And they only have to maintain the last one and the recipes to get you there. So, yeah. But not, not with all, obviously. Not all. No, we're trying to branch out, but you, you, we need that buy-in. Like, we have enough credibility with the existing ones, but it's also you need a certain set of skills to develop these recipes, and not every library or framework author has that uh, capacity to do it. Okay. So in that case, we're really thankful for anyone in the community to develop those recipes. So, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, that's great. Yeah, no, cheers. Uh, hello, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, regarding your sample with uh, string utils is empty. Uh, it's kind of possible that in some cases uh, it's very evident from the court above that the argument of is empty is already not null. Yep. And in this case, now check will be redundant. Can open rewrite? Uh, infer this and remove redundant check automatically? Not right now. We can't yet infer if it's nullable, but we are looking to add this to the type system that we have so that we are able to uh, change our behavior if we know that it is null or guaranteed not to be null. So it's something that we, we noticed as well. It seems silly to add a null check if you know that it's not going to be null. So um, we're looking to improve, but it's, uh, yeah, we. we we're not a big company. We're trying continuously to improve these kind of things as well. And uh, there are also, I saw in tests that you showed that uh, sometimes double negation is created because negation was in original code and you are adding another negation. Can it be cleaned up automatically yep. after that? So we, we have recipes to clean that up after the fact. And those are very easy to do with the refaster style of templates. So we're leaving that in for now. We, we've decided because we're uh, phasing out those method calls that we're not going to first do the negation and then do the cleanup. But we're just going to run that cleanup and, and yeah, find any similar instances elsewhere still. I'm also wondering uh, that uh, implementation of replace template, you have something like java template.compile or something and pass lambda there. How exactly does it work? Is it some Byte code magic or something? Uh, I have more technical colleagues who can tell you exactly how that works. I can probably try to find out, but I can't re recall that exactly right now. So we do invoke the parser uh, to check what it actually produces. 
But yeah, they're, they're really big details. I'll, I invite you to join our Slack, and we can uh, discuss that there. OK, thank you very much. Cheers. Hi. And, yeah. and don't forget, I have stickers. I, I keep forgetting to tell people, so I put it on the slide. Come find me if you want a sticker. Hi, great Cheers. talk and great product. Uh, you mentioned you have some integrations about rules from SonarCube. Do you have some integrations or plans to integrate with uh, Snook, Problem Snook, because they're more vulnerability oriented? Um, so uh, the recipe that I only uh, didn't show you the results of is the um, checking for any vulnerabilities and transitive uh, dependency vulnerabilities that we have. So we're able to um, yeah, do a similar functional thing there, but we don't integrate with Sneak because we figured, well, we have our own model, we have our own database of uh, vulnerabilities, or the, the GitHub database of vulnerabilities that we use right now. So we're able to yeah, do the exact same type of changes, but it's not as an integration with. Cool, that's fair enough. Thanks. Cheers. Oh, one more in the back. I am just curious about the capacity of the tool. Uh, I've had one or two instances where I had to downgrade. Is it a possibility for you to do that? Uh, we actually had a, a, a very poor person in our community develop recipes to um, change code from Java 17 back to 11. So we're able to define recipes, but it gets tricky quite quickly, because if you have a record that is maybe defined locally, you have to generate a name for it, and you, there's some things you can do, but it's hard to do reliably. So we can get you part of the way there, but likely you just want to yeah, uh, talk with management again and try to uh, get upgraded to the latest version. Because it's, it's no longer like a, a time investment. It's just something you do and that you do continuously, not once every five years. Cheers. So if there's no further questions, feel free to come up uh, as well. Um, and then thank you all again. Cheers. <laughs>